Hello and welcome. Um, my name is Fabio Gigi. I'm the chair of the Japan Research Center um, here at SOAS. And I'm very happy to welcome you all in the middle of the flu season that is now replacing uh, COVID season. Um, so I thought it would be um, very apt to sort of concentrate in uh, these last three lectures uh, before Christmas on questions on the history of science and uh, technology. And it's a great honor for me uh, to introduce the speaker of today, Dr. Aya Home. Uh, Aya is a lecturer in Japanese studies um, at the University of Manchester, and she specialized in the uh, history of healthcare and medicine um, in modern Japan. And she has written about issues of reproduction, uh, population, and sovereignty. Uh, she's the author of the forthcoming book, Science for Governing Japan's Population, uh, which will appear from Cambridge uh, University Press. And she has uh, co-edited uh, several special issues um, on population control in Cold War Asia, for example, uh, for the uh, East Asian Science, Technology and Society Journal, and uh, critical approaches to reproduction and population in post-war Japan for uh, the Japan uh, Forum, uh, which appeared this year. Uh, her uh, talk today is entitled Family Planning in Post-World War II Japan Through a Transnational Lens. Thank you very much for being here and I hand over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Fabio, for such a nice introduction and it's really nice to see uh, many names, uh, if I don't see faces, uh, of uh, the people I know. Um, well, so thanks for coming uh, to you too. So let me first share screen. Uh, I hope it's going to work. We tried and tested. Um, please let me know if it doesn't. Um, okay, because, oh, I think that was, so is that okay? Yeah, yes. great, okay. So uh, without much, Further ado, I'm going to start. <laughs> so yeah, um, so thanks again to Fabio for inviting me to speak this exciting series. Uh, and then also Charles uh, for advertising this event, who is uh, behind, the, um, behind the screen at the moment. Um, so as you see on the screen, my talk today is about family planning in post uh, Second World War Japan, uh, which I examine uh, using a transnational uh, lens. And this is, uh, this is the forthcoming book from Cambridge University Press, which um, uh, Fabio kindly uh, introduced uh, at, the, at the beginning. Uh, so, uh, the title of the book is uh, Science for Governing Japan's Population. Um, hopefully it's going to come out uh, next year. Um, at the moment, going through the index um, indexes, which is quite a laborious, laborious but exciting um, task. And exciting because it's going to, you know, it's, I, I have a feeling it's going towards the end. Now, just briefly introduce the book. Um, it's a work uh, of uh, social history, which examines various um, scientific fields that um, uh, was established around the notion of uh, Japan's uh, population. Now, um, and um, I look at uh, also uh, the, the fields that were also more uh, scientific practices that were mobilized for the governing of the population in modern Japan. Now, uh, population, uh, as many of you know, uh, was uh, a neologism, um, as, uh, as so many other uh, kind of new words created in the modern period, in the Meiji period. And my book is going to look at um, Kind of uh, science, how the, the roles of the science uh, in uh, kind of uh, for the governing of uh, Japan's uh, Japanese people, this neologism, this new idea uh, as population. Now, um, for the book, I'm going to introduce, uh, I'm now going through this book because uh, today's talk uh, is actually uh, part, of, uh, part, uh, part of this, uh, this book uh, I'm going to. Um, the part of this book. So that's why uh, please, um, please allow me to introduce uh, a, a book for uh, the book for uh, a little while. So now in the book, uh, I present 
two arguments. Now, the first is that the, um, the creation of the human and social science population and the state sovereignty, which is based on population management, had a symbiotic relationship. Um, and each was driven by surrounding ideologies, institutional agendas, uh, socio-political and material conditions, and also personal motivations. And the second argument is that um, transnational elements, forces, uh, were important in shaping science making and nation building, um, although the interplay on the surface asserts the nation-centered discourse. So, um, so to elaborate on these arguments in the book, uh, I present a total of six case studies, and one of them is about post-war family planning, uh, the topic of today's presentation. Now, just to talk about the semantics, because uh, I'm, um, um, I'm pretty sure many of you are stu students or, or, or uh, scholars of Japanese um, studies. Um, so the term family planning or kazuku keikaku in Japanese um, spread around the Second World War and it kind of direct, so it spread after, after the Second World War and it directly corresponded with the post-war drive to social reform that was aimed to generate um, the moral, efficient and disciplined modern families. It's uh, the, kind of, um, the kind of thing that um, Andrew Gordon talked about. But the term family planning was also used synonymously with um, another one called birth control or in Japanese, jutai chosets or sanji sege. Now they existed, these terms existed um, before, already before the pre-war period. So now getting back to the subject and uh, to follow the book's argument today, I'll focus on the transnational elements uh, that importantly shaped family planning in Japan after the Second World War, particularly uh, the birth control pilot programs and research initiatives in the 50s that were seen as vital for the post-war reconstruction. Um, okay, so, and by transnational elements, I mean primarily uh, the flow of flow and exchange, of money, goods, personnel, and knowledge across national borders, um, and also involving individuals and organizations whose actions were not necessarily always confined by a modern state as a political unit. So the state, uh, the uh, state uh, as a background, acted um, uh, as an important kind of pivot. So, and in the specific context of family planning in post uh, Second World War um, and in Japan, these transnational elements primarily meant the elements within the, uh, what I call the transnational population control movement or the transnational efforts that were instigated by demographers, public health specialists, philanthropists, and government technocrats in the middle of the, uh, the 20th century to curb the growth of world population by popularizing the birth control practice with contraceptives in the so-called underdeveloped countries. Now, with this understanding, today I'll specifically tell the story of um, the birth control pilot programs of research that were organized and run in the 1950s and 1960s by the teams at the uh, Department of Public Health Demography um, at the Institute of Public Health, which used to be uh, right in the middle of Tokyo. Um, now it's in, in, uh, in Saitama, relocated to Saitama. Now, these birth control uh, initiatives were headed by Koya Yoshio, uh, who you can see uh, the kind of image, the pixel, the pixel is not really great, so uh, the resolution is not that great, so you can only see a kind of blurry image of him, but that's Koya. Now, Koya was the director of the Institute and uh, one of the most prominent racial scientists and eugenicists in Japan at the time. I'm going to come back to him later. Okay. And I chose this story 
because the birth control initiatives of the Institute of Public Health, on the one hand, um, really influenced and were influenced by domestic birth control policies. But on the other hand, it was also entangled in this transnational efforts to curb the world um, population growth. But what do I want to achieve with this story? Right? So what is the objective um, of um, today's talk? Now, in Japanese history, um, post-war family planning for a long time has been told with the nation-focused um, kind of perspective. Now, this is inevitable precisely because the nation state plays an overwhelmingly important role in constructing population discourses that drive reproductive policies. Like for instance, uh, the discourse of population crisis today, uh, which you know, drives policy to boost fertility or, uh, or, or, and, and promote childcare, you know, is informed by a, a demographic graph, graph, such as the one you see on the screen, um, now, and, and that is predicated on the notion of Japan as a contained nation state. Right? So, so kind of to almost like challenge this nation uh, focused narrative, um, I want to, I, uh, today I want to, what I want to do is um, with, the, with the story is um, to really decenter this narrative right, of the post uh, World War II Japanese reproductive policies and politics uh, by showing how family planning uh, in post war Japan, which was first and foremost associated with the na national project of post war reconstruction, was in fact uh, buttressed by this transnational, these transnational elements. And at the same time, I also want to kind of complicate the role of the Japanese government and the US dominated allied occupation in um, post-war Japan's reproductive control and population management, uh, which ended up producing the image such as the demographic chart again, um, you see on the screen. So in this sense, uh, this work is built on the recent works uh, by uh, scholars such as uh, Aiko Takeuchi Demirchi or Christine Roebuck, who explain the history of reproduction in post-war Japan as part and parcel of the global exchange on race, modernity, and sovereignty in the post-war, post-colonial world. Now, on that note, uh, let me first uh, talk about the nation-centered narrative of reproduction and population problems that emerged in Japan after the Second World War to give you some uh, overview. So official and public intellectuals immediately after Japan's surrender in 1945 now began to argue Japan was confronted with two kinds of um, population problems by Jinko Monbai. The first being the crisis um, in the quality of the Japanese race. And the second one was overpopulation, which was brought by the so-called baby boom, uh, post-war baby boom, uh, and the sudden influx of repatriated soldiers and civilians from the war front and Japan's colonies that it lost after the surrender. Now, to solve these population problems, the government first uh, revised the wartime uh, national eugenic law and implemented the eugenic protection law in 1948. Now, eugenic protection law, as many of you know, aimed to protect the quality of the Japanese population or race by controlling the reproductive bodies of the people, uh, 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 people allegedly with inferior biological traits through abortion, contraception, and sterilization. But the law, especially the amendment in the 1949, uh, that de facto legalized abortions in Japan led to the um, surge in the number of abortion cases. So to counter this trend, the government's uh, advisory council on population problems uh, proposed to popularize birth control across the country. Now in 1951, 
the cabinet approved the, uh, the proposal uh, from the council um, uh, and decided to make it a national policy to popularize uh, kind of spread birth control across the nation. Now, based on this, in 1952, the government then amended the eugenic protection law and built a public health infrastructure to facilitate the teaching of contraceptive methods among the mass, among the people across the country. Now, behind this government's move was Koya Yoshio, uh, the man, uh, the figure I, uh, in today's talk I introduced earlier. So, Koya is a must individual for scholars who study the history of race science in modern Japan. Uh, um, Koya's name already appears uh, in Oguma Age's um, you know, classical works on the Japanese race uh, uh, and identity from the late 1980s. So Koya was one of the most influential medical um, researchers in race science, and he was also a promoter of eugenics in the um, prime of his career, which um, kind of spanned uh, uh, what um, 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 Miriam uh, Kingsburg called a transfer period, so kind of roughly between 1930s and 1960s. Now he was the vice president uh, of the Japan Association for Racial Hygiene, also sorry, 30s and 60s. So vice president of Japan Association for Racial Hygiene when it was established in 1930. Um, and, um, and he was so he was a really kind of from the kind of pre-war period, a powerful uh, within the kind of powerful circle of intellectuals aimed to promote eugenics. Now then after. And, and Koya also originally had career in the academia, so as professor of medicine at Kanazawa University, but from 1939 uh, became a technocrat. So Gikan uh, was hired as a technocrat uh, when the Ministry of Health and Welfare was established in 1938. So Koya as uh, being a race, you know, a race of scientist was at the heart of the Ministry um, of Health and Welfare's race studies, and at the same time involved in drafting important policy documents that led to the uh, general plan for the establishment of population policies, which was established in 1940. So for the remainder of the war, um, Koya was the, was the um, uh, really kind of led the um, racial and you know, race studies within the uh, Ministry of Health and Welfare Research Institute. And after the war, um, Koya, you know, continued to be, um, kind of continued to excel uh, in, uh, in the government's health uh, administration. Um, and in fact, um, Koya became appointed by the uh, General Headquarters, GHQ, to head the Institute of Public Health uh, and actually remained in the position until he moved to Nihon University in the 1960s. And from the late 1940s, he used his, this influential status and um, he worked very hard to persuade the government to implement eugenic birth control programs as population policies right, to, uh, to solve the, the population problems. Now, at the same time, after the war, uh, Koya established himself as a really central figure in the popular birth control movement, so he became an activist um, himself. So while being a, an activist, um, Koya was also um, at the heart of the policymaking process. So um, as the head of the Institute of Public Health, um, Koya had connections with um, the health with, uh, officials, both in the Japanese government and the, in the SCAP GHQ, um, and especially uh, had a connection with um, uh, Crawford F. Sams on the screen on the, uh, the, the left um, uh, from, uh, from the, on the image next to Koya, um, who, was the, who was heading the public health and welfare section at the time. And also Koya was a member of the advisory council on population problems, uh, which advised, like I said earlier, which advised the government on the population matters. 
Now, evidence shows that it was um, Koya who swayed the opinion of Hashimoto Ryogo, who was health minister at the time in the, um, kind of in the early 1950s um, in favor of birth control. Now, but as you can imagine, um, so I don't have that much time to talk about the pre-war um, kind of politics of birth control, but birth control was actually a really sensitive topic um, in, in Japan or elsewhere um, since the pre-war period um, and within the government officials and among the experts. Um, in the specific context after the war, um, it was a controversial subject because of its association with the Nazi genocide of the Jews in the Nuremberg trial, and also because there was this there was a voice that birth control was popular only among the educated urban middle class, and because of that, it would promote the so-called reverse selection. Um, which he used as well, quite uh, on and on, uh, Koya, which referred to the shrinking of the biologically, so called biologically stereo uh, urban middle class uh, and the parallel expansion of the people in other classes uh, with so called biologically inferior traits. So, the, um, so eventually, those um, biologically inferior groups uh, would take over. Um, over the, the kind of you know, biologically superior group within the, within the group, within the race, and then the racial uh, quality kind of goes down, is the idea of reverse, was the idea of reverse selection. Now, because of that, uh, birth control was not a uh, uh, kind of popular um, um, topic in policy for a long time. So to counter these voices of concern, um, Koya proposed a, what, what he called guided uh, birth control program. Now in the guided birth control program, government officials and population experts and health practitioners would work hand in hand to promote um, contraception through what Koya called guidance or sometimes enlightenment activity he called. Um, so the biggest feature of the guided program was that it, it aimed narrowly at target groups, um, the groups with growing populations. And of course, for, for this, Koya identified rural, pop, uh, so those who are supposed to have um, kind of infer supposedly inferior traits, such as rural populations or workers and benefit recipients in cities uh, as the target. He, he, for his uh, guided uh, birth control programs, he, he, he kind of narrowly uh, targeted um, the, that at those groups. Now, Koya suggested through this um, guided birth control program, the government could have, basically could have a cake and eat it. So in other words, they could prevent, uh, sorry, prevent the population growth and shield the racial quality of the Japanese at the same time. So in the, late, in the late 1940s, uh, using his power within the institution, Institute of Public Health, Koya then managed to establish the Department of Public Health Demography um, as a research institute uh, conducting policy relevant research on birth control, eugenics and population phenomena. Now, what you see on the screen is um, the stated areas of expertise uh, of the department at the time of the foundation. Now, you can see clearly that you know, public health demography was built around Koya's uh, political and research interest and, and was intended to generate data that would be directly useful for the government to evaluate the efficacy of um, the government's uh, birth control policies. So based on that, um, in the 1950s and until the kind of early 1960s, um, Koya uh, organized many kind of studies, like right? uh, these are application uh, driven uh, kind of projects. Um, so you would set the um, kind of uh, pilot, uh, kind of experimental kind of pilot studies um, sets uh, within, uh, within a village, recruited villagers and, kind of, um, you know, had the um, kind of spread 
uh, taught birth control and then, you know, uh, let them use um, uh, contraceptives and, and kind of measured how, how they use it and that kind of thing. So yeah, so Koya did that in all sorts of different villages and villages or cities in different locations. Um, and uh, many of them are called, uh, you know, what we call now uh, longitudinal studies. So they, you know, they would chase, um, you know, they would follow the contraceptive use for an, a number of years and, and then collate data. Um, um, so that's what they did. Now, the goals of the project in Koya's mind uh, were twofold. So he had two main goals. The first was to show uh, the growing number of induced abortion rates um, and also the guided birth program as an effective countermeasure for the growing population of uh, popularity of abortion and also the population growth itself and also racial crisis. So as you can see, again, uh, um, you know, these are, uh, you know, directly relevant for um, policy, birth control policy that, you know, uh, would, uh, you know, that was made as a countermeasure for uh, abortion, a growing number of abortion. So specifically, the study, these studies were intended to show the effectiveness of the program in reducing both birth rates and abortion rates among the target groups. Okay, so I'm going to briefly explain, uh, kind of show you um, what it was like uh, just to, uh, uh, by introducing these, uh, the three village study. So now the three village study was, oh, 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 oh hello, hello. <laughs> I don't know what happened here. Um, so, okay, so sometimes they're called, it was the three model village study. Like I said, it was a longitudinal study. So it lasts for seven years between 1950 and 57. And I don't know what, what, what is, why it's, it's, it's like this, but in any case, maybe I, that, maybe uh, that technology is um, telling me to skip that part. So Perhaps I'm going to skip that part. If you're interested, I'm going to talk about it later. But in any case, um, with this study, Koya, um, Koya argued that, um, so the number of uh, pregnancies uh, dropped and also number of abortion cases dropped. Um, you know, so he, in, in the end, uh, concluded that uh, this pilot uh, birth control program was successful. Um, you know, they they would they would um, uh, they would, you know uh, in in the village they would teach um, uh, local midwives or local doctors would have lectures and also one on one consultation or home visits to teach um, the methods of birth control and also how uh, why birth control is really good. So lecture on birth control and then um, use. Uh, kind of distributed um, different kinds of uh, contraceptive methods, um, including condom, condom, diaphragm, you know, jelly, or all sorts of things, um, and uh, let uh, let couples decide um, what to take. Obviously, this is um, at the time um, this was targeted towards uh, married people. Uh, it wasn't, you know, unmarried people. Clearly, uh, they were not supposed to have. Sex. Right, uh, uh, have children, so it was you know categorically um, kind of um, uh, you know aimed at married people. But anyway, so so it was it was a success. He he declared success, Koya. And after that, um, for each of these studies, um, Koya uh, promoted their success stories really globally by publishing. In English, uh, as you see, uh, in, also um, in the three village case, uh, studies case, it was the case as well. Now the question is, why was that? Obviously, you know, you could say, well, you know, um, English was becoming lingua franca in science, so you know, obviously, if you want to, um, you know, as as an academic, if you want to get yourself known, you publish in English. You know, similar kind of um, um, uh, rationale that, you know, uh, you know, that um, 
uh, that's you know that has a currency today uh, must have also had the you know it was the case uh, at the time. But I argue that it was more than that. Um, and um, to respond to this question, that the English publication in fact illuminates. Uh, I argue how embedded Koya's applied studies was in the, the transnational population control movement that I just um, explained earlier. Now, I use this expression, um, this uh, transnational population control movement, um, as a shorthand to refer to this really amorphous efforts um, occurred transnationally in the middle of the 20th century to um, curb the growth of world population via family planning with contraceptives in the so-called underdeveloped countries. Um, so this movement uh, was really buttressed by the, by the modernization theory, um, which insisted that overpopulation was coterminous to poverty and uh, outmoded traditional cultures. Um, so highlighted the role of family planning as a technique of population, global population control, but also um, I, I, by extension, a technique of socioeconomic development. Now, initially, um, <clears throat> um, international oriented charitable organization, especially Rockefeller Foundation, um, uh, played a leading role in part because of John D. Rockefeller third initiative. He, he, he was really like at, the, at the forefront. He was a forerunner of the movement. But also um, from the mid 1960s, especially after the US government under the uh, Lyndon B. Johnson's administration integrated family planning in its development aids program, Family planning became established uh, as part of international health and overseas development um, uh, aid and assistance. Now, an overwhelming feature of the movement was that the scientific experts um, on birth control, for instance, demographers, or um, and uh, especially the researchers based in the US. Uh, led the movement in partnership with the technocrats of the so-called recipient countries or nations. Uh, because the knowledge about how best birth control could be deployed to combat the population growth and, and poverty needed, to, needed yet to be established. Now, specifically, they would conduct field work, um, and also studying, you know, in which they study the sexual and reproductive behaviors of a local population, um, and also acceptance rate in family planning pilot studies. Um, and exactly the kind of research Koya uh, was conducting within Japan, but they did it in the so-called recipient countries. Now, of course, then um, those uh, scientific experts would meet um, at international conferences um, and um, share the knowledge from the field work and promoted family planning, you know, um, and, and you know, in front of uh, other attendants and, and uh, uh, who were technocrats from the recipient countries. So, it, uh, and also um, other kind of non-governmental and international organizations, for instance, the International Planned Parenthood Federation. And so to a great extent, because of these activities, the field of demography, especially in the United States, really thrived in the mid, -19, mid 20th century. Now, looking at Japan in the, uh, in the late 40s and 50s, you see some individuals who participated in the international movement significantly influenced the Japanese government's birth, birth control policy and Koya's activities too. So, Within again, this happened. I don't know why. Um, so within the government, I'm really sorry. I don't know why this is happening. Um, so if this happens again, I'm just going to summarize again. So within the uh, GAP GHQ, these are the kind. These are the, the kinds of people. So Edward Ackerman, uh, Pascal K. Welton, and Warren S. Simpson. So they were. Um, you know, they, they were there um, uh, um, 
serving the Staff GHQ as um, consultants or advisors, scientific advisors. Now, they were all academics um, and served for the um, GHQ as consultants and stayed in Japan for only a few months at a time. However, the network they forged with the Japanese colleagues and knowledge about Japanese situations they gained during their stay became an important factor when the Japanese technocrats such as Koya took part in the international movement. Now, in addition to the academic consultants serving the um, GHQ, um, <laughs> I don't know why this is happening. Um, what I wanted to say is, in addition to that, um, okay, now I don't know what to do. Um, Okay, <laughs> what I wanted to say is, <laughs> I have no idea why this is happening, um, but uh, I'm probably going to summarize then, um, is that, um, so, in, so in addition to um, GHQ, you had also uh, Rockefeller Foundation, so the personnel that came from, um, uh, well, that were dispatched by the uh, by the Rockefeller Foundation, um, who were stationed in Japan at the time, uh, they played a really pivotal role as well. Uh, one of them called Oliver McCoy. I wanted to show you the, um, the slides, but somehow it just doesn't work. No, um, it was um, also uh, was really important for Koya because Oliver McCoy, uh, was uh, based in the Institute of Public Health, Health where you know, Koya directed. And um, he kind of liaised between uh, Koya and the GHQ, but also Rockefeller Foundation on uh, kind of reproductive um, kind of policies and, and, and also, um, yeah, okay, so uh, Yona is, saying maybe you close and reopen the PowerPoint. Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm going to try that because um, this is uh, significantly, I have to uh, skip the, um, skip the um, presentation. So, the ghost in the machine. I have no idea. It. <laughs> it, it, hap it happens occasionally, it's very strange. Yeah, somehow it doesn't want me to talk about Rockefeller Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> now that, there's a thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> okay, so let me just, um, okay, so that again. Right, okay, I'm do the presenter view. Nope, it's still the case. Oh well, I'll just I'll just summarize it then. Um, so yeah, so there's Rockefeller, uh, and Rockefeller connection was good. Uh, also really important for Koya because, um, uh, well, at least uh, some of the personnel called Marshall Balfour, who was stationed in uh, Hong Kong at the time and later India. Now this is going to be quite important in the story I want to tell later. Um, kind of liaised between Koya and the people in, in uh, the, his colleagues in, in India. Um, and so kind of created the kind of inter-Asian network by right? these, these um, um, Rockefeller Foundation um, uh, kind of uh, delegates. But really what I want to say is more than, more than Rockefeller, more than these uh, GHQ consultants, the, the, the figure who was really important for uh, Koya's research was the guy called G Clarence G. J. Gamble. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm really hoping because I want to know. So Clarence J. Gamble um, was a, he was a, uh, the guy on the screen, you can see, uh, uh, <laughs> was, um, was an American uh, researcher. He was an American birth control um, kind of researcher, but also he was, as you can see, um, if, if you know P&G, 
the company that uh, produces, you know, like everyday essentials like soap and, um, and um, you know, shampoo and these kind of things. It's called Procter and it used to be called Procter and Gamble. So he was an heir of this Gamble uh, uh, who created this uh, soap fortune, soap empire. Uh, and so he had a, a lot of money with him. And with that money, um, he basically, he, um, through, uh, um, he became very interested in um, developing uh, contraceptives uh, from the 1930s um, and kind of using his, his, his wealth um, uh, kind of helped uh, birth control research or so research that you know, develops contraceptives since 1930s. Now, um, so initial, so, so Gamble became interested in Japan through uh, the contacts uh, uh, he had. Um, so, so through, for instance, uh, Frank W. Nordstein or Warren Thompson, who served either, uh, who, who were in Japan, uh, serving either for uh, the GHQ as academic consultants or, you know, uh, kind of completing uh, Rockefeller missions. So during the 1940s, in the late 1940s, Gamble then got in touch with um, uh, these guys, um, became very, very interested because um, he heard uh, the rumor that um, the Japanese government was considering um, implementing some birth control as a national policy. And so through these connections, right, so through these American, American connections, um, you know, Americans who, uh, you know, were in Japan at the time, you know, once or twice or so, um, he got to know Koya. And then really quickly, they became really close friends. And um, so, and then started to, you know, fund Koya's research. Now, from Koya's perspective, this is a really welcome, um, you know, move, you know, the, because although um, the government set, um, you know, birth control uh, as, a, as, a, as a national policy, um, the government was underfunded. So, you know, in, Koya was always in need of getting external funding. And so really welcome Koya uh, Gamble's support. So from the, um, from the 1950s, kind of early 1950s, um, supported um, Koya's, um, Koya's uh, birth control research uh, at the Department of Public Health Demography. And, um, okay. and particularly, you know, and so what he did was not only just funding, but also really he had heavy hand, handed uh, approach to uh, certain uh, research. So he would, for instance, uh, not only uh, uh, give, give money, but also he would um, suggest uh, the, the design of the uh, design of the research, uh, the, the pilot project. And, um, and also helped um, Koya in writing English. So, you know, in, in the archives I visited, I could see a lot of um, um, a lot of papers where they, they exchanged the, uh, um, you know, uh, the proofs. So he was not only proofs, but or even like earlier draft um, kind of stage. Um, and so he would correct English, but he would also suggest which data should, should go in for which publication. So really heavy handed approach to Koya's research. Now, the question then, which is to do with this, um, what you've been seeing on the screen in front of you, why was Gamble interested in helping Koya? What motivated him to support Koya's Japanese birth control pilot project? Now, one big factor behind Gamble's support in Japan was his ongoing quest for uh, a, what he called simple contraceptive methods. 
Now, Gamble believed that population control realized through the fertility regulation among the people of the underdeveloped countries should adopt a simple contraceptive method because he assumed that the target population in such a family planning program was uneducated. So the existing contraceptives such as pessaries were too complicated for them. Now, based on this understanding, since the 1930s, like I said, Gamble was carrying out research right, that developed simple contraceptive methods. Now, in the 1940s, when Asia's overpopulation became an agenda in the transnational population control movement, Gamble financially supported the distribution of the so-called phone tablet in India. So the phone tablet was a spermicidal tablet, which a woman inserted into her vagina ahead of the intercourse. And the tablet containing spermicidal chemicals then formed up and built a barrier that prevented you know, sperm from entering the, into, entering the uterus. Now, in the, in the early 1950s, Gamble became particularly interested in Koya's research when he heard that the Japanese uh, pharmaceutical company, Asai, uh, in Japanese it's called Asai, um, developed the foam tablet called Sampoon. Now, so, at the time, Gamble then urged, as soon as he learned about, um, about, about Sampoon, Gamble then urged Koya to set up a pilot project and test the efficacy of Sampoon. Uh, so Gamble wanted to compare the Sampoon's efficacy with the efficacy of the existing foam tablets, which were currently in the market, especially in India, and hopefully, uh, replace them with Sampoon if Sampoon turn out to be more effective. Now, so for this reason, uh, Gamble uh, financially supported and also had a heavy handed approach to one of Koya's birth control pilot project that Gamble called um, the foam tablet or Kajiya village study. So, uh, which started in um, uh, which started in, in October. So the experimental, uh, the, the, um, the pilot study uh, started in October 1953 uh, in, uh, in Kajiya village, they called it 40 miles south of Tokyo, uh, just in Kanagawa prefecture. So in a way, so uh, Gamble's fervor for simple, con simple contraceptive methods was combined with Koya's interest in promoting guided birth control program in Japan and eventually um, the knowledge about the Japanese uh, family planning initiative not only had lasting impact on the domestic reproductive and population policy and lives of the people taking part in the pilot projects in Japan, but also traveled across national borders and became part of the narrative in the transnational population movement. So, then what came out of the transnational connections enabled by the you know, GHQ, Rockefeller Foundation and Gamble? What were the results? So to start with, in a fairly simple term, these transnational connections really enhanced the transnational exchanges of personnel, goods and, and knowledge. Um, so in terms of personnel, uh, the Department of Public Health Demography researchers um, studied abroad, and then they presented at the international conferences or met government officials in underdeveloped countries, in, all funded by, for instance, a Rockefeller Foundation or Gamble. And also, um, in turn, um, these uh, the Koya and his team at DPHD uh, invited uh, non-Japanese uh, colleagues uh, to Japan. Uh, what you see on the, on the image here is a, a, um, a, a snippet from uh, from the visit of uh, Rama Rao, who is um, uh, who was the, the the founder of the International Parent um, Planned Parenthood in uh, uh, as well as the um, the India uh, uh, Family Planning Association in India. Um, okay, so, and in terms of goods, money, contraceptives, papers, photos, telegrams, all sorts of things were exchanged. And the knowledge wise, like I said just now, 
um, you know, knowledge about birth control practices in Japan and the image that uh, Japan was at the forefront of population control in Asia um, kind of became consolidated through these uh, transnational exchanges. But really more broadly, the transnational connections really consolidated Koyas and his team's position within Japan um, Japanese birth control policy and in the transnational movement at the same time. Uh, and also um, through these international connections, um, uh, the um, Department of Public Health um, Demography's researchers and their research became integral part of the transnational network, which buttressed the efforts to discipline reproductive bodies in underdeveloped countries. And also um, the, connect, the transnational connection kind of enhanced Japan's ties, not only with the US, but also India, with India and other kind of free world allies. And of course, the Cold War here um, that plays a pivotal role as a background here. So finally, so with the story today that kind of clearly pointed out these transnational exchanges, um, buttressed uh, Koya's policy relevant birth control activities, I wanted to illustrate how porous the Japanese and the Japanese government and the allied occupation were as governing bodies overseeing reproductive and population matters, even as they have been presented as self-contained political units in the history of family planning in post-war Japan. Right, okay, with this, I finish my presentation. Um, and sorry about the technical glitch. I don't know what happened there. Thank you very much. Somebody clearly didn't want you to share these uh, images. Well, maybe we can come uh, back to them, but thank you very much for a really fascinating uh, talk. Uh, I learned a great deal and I was particularly struck by the difference between this sort of immediate post-war discourse and the later discourses that form around the use of the pill, the contraceptive pill, which seem to be almost belong to a completely different um, sort of discourse. Um, and I was, I was wondering, um, I was wanted to start you off um, with that question, what, because the, when, when uh, uh, Koya de developed the, or designed the village study, I mean, what, what, what was the language that, I mean, it seemed from the pictures that you showed, it seemed that there will be sort of a medical professional and there will be an assistant and they will talk to married couples. And I wonder what, what kind of language was used in these exchanges? Would you try to keep it very technical, medical, or would it be, or did you think about, because he, he spent a, a lot of time developing these research methodologies. Did he think about, you know, what language would be appropriate? Uh, because obviously the elephant in the room is sex, right? So you have to somehow to mention um, when this happens or how this happens. Yeah, so yeah, thank, you, thank you for this question. It's, it's an interesting, it is a very important question actually. Um, so the question, uh, you know, what language was, was being used? So I think, yes, Koya was quite, um, Koya knew, um, his his social standing and and of course the um, you know this elite um, public health um, you know researchers right so um, and that they were quite you know their social standing is very different from their target you know um, population so what they did was like you said so you saw uh, in one of the slides uh, which was skipped actually <laughs> um, is the is the image of um, kind of uh, uh, a female figure teaching about, um, um, you know, about, about sex. And so what, what they did in these, um, uh, in these test uh, villages was, was to really employ female public health uh, practitioners or, or midwives. Um, so I wrote a paper about, about that in the past because um, I managed to, in fact, uh, interview uh, a, a midwife turned into public health specialist, um, you know, in, in this little village, uh, one of the village, uh, test villages. And yeah, she was, she was very, very important. My, my argument is that she was uh, not only important uh, for the success of the, the, the product, 
um, the project, you know, uh, because he, she, she, in a way, kind of translated the scientific language into the everyday, everyday language. And of course, you know, being a midwife, um, she had some trust among, uh, you know, local women. Um, and so, um, so she could, you know, who, you know, confided in all sorts of some, sometimes very controversial, you know, um, subjects, right? Um, and so, um, so there was a, you know, so of course the then the, you know, the the doctors, the the, the research team took, well, I, I wouldn't say took advantage of, but you know, certainly uh, maximize the, the role of the midwife. Um, and, and the local uh, health, you know, female health practitioners um, for the success. But my, my, my argument is that, that that was, you know, certainly important for the success of the project itself, but also for scientific research, because she then was collecting all the data, right? And then, you know, passing it on to the researchers. So without this data, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have worked this scientific research. Um, yeah. Right, thank you very much. So there's a, a question early on in the chat uh, that asked from Hermione that asks, to what extent were parallel FP studies in India, such as the USA funded Kanna study and Rockefeller work in East Africa, as well as research in Nigeria influenced, uh, or it, how did they influence the design of the Japan research work in the 50s and 60s? Seems there is considerable similarity. So thank you so much. Um, this is fantastic question. So in uh, another, so this is in the book, <laughs> I do talk about how Koya um, then um, interacted with researchers who was doing, uh, who were doing Kana study. So um, how, you know, Gamble's money in a way enabled um, the kind of inter-Asian relationship. You know, so yeah, yeah, there was a parallel, you know, um, projects, right? So, so I would say, um, in terms of um, Kajia village studies and Kanna were absolute parallel. So I don't know about the uh, about the other one in in Nigeria, but certainly in Gamble's mind. So Gamble was um, actually um, behind the back. So he didn't want to be named named, in, uh, you know. So, but but financially supporting the Kanna study as well as Kajia study at the same time. And, you know, it was also Gambo who um, then uh, let Koya travel to Kana itself and kind of had them, you know, had him interacted with um, uh, not only the American, um, you know, research team that was leading the study, but also local, um, you know, health uh, officials and Ramarao as well. Um, but so certainly, uh, you know, uh, uh, the connection is there. And at the same time, in fact, when he went to India, he actually had gone to Egypt before that. So I don't know about Nigeria. Nigeria didn't really feature in, at least when I read, you know, his, his correspondence, Koya's correspondence with um, Gamble. But, but certainly, yeah, Tana, definitely there. So, so as you can see, like, these were really amorphous, but also connected stories, right? And the Japanese case was, um, I think started a little bit earlier, I think I would say, con compared to other um, projects, um, part because, you know, the Japanese government was quite interested in, in doing the research. And also the Japanese one was also um, unique in the, in the abortion, because they were really interested in abortion. Right, so, so to try to kind of mitigate, you know, mitigate or the lower the uh, number of abortion cases. Um, so Tana study also uh, studied. Um, uh, sorry for for others who who don't know this, this this study. It also studied foam tablets. You know, the efficacy of foam tablets in a uh, very small village um, called Tana uh, in, in 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 India. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sorry, I, I always get carried away uh, with my own questions. So uh, I forgot to say, please, uh, you can either raise your hand, put your questions into the Q&A, um, but I can also see that in the chat, there's a few questions coming up. So we're open on all channels. And there was a raised hand at the very beginning uh, by David Walter. Um, if you want to ask your question, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, kind of a, a twin one. Uh, was Koyo Yoshio ever 
suspected of being part of any atrocities during the Second World War? And how did these policies affect the feminist movement in Japan in later years? Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the for an interesting lecture. Aya. Thank you very much, David, for this uh, wonderful question. Um, so so as, as many technocrats um, who were kind of mid-career, uh, mid to kind of advanced career technocrats, um, he was let off. Um, he himself didn't, I mean, he was, um, you know, certainly involved in, um, you know, drafting the uh, national eugenic law, which promoted sterilization. Um, but in fact, you know, the, the actual sterilization cases in the in the wartime was was not that was not the great. It wasn't, you know, it, it had to it had to go through all sorts of uh, bureaucratic hoops. So uh, the number was not that great. So it wasn't as um, I'm, not, I'm not saying, of course, that the number, you know, doesn't matter, but it wasn't as prominent as, you know, the Nazis um, kind of atrocity, you know, atrocity in of uh, Jews. And, and in, the, in the Japanese case, the atrocity through um, kind of reproductive means um, wasn't as highlighted. Um, so, yeah, he was let off. Uh, like I said, you know, he, he, he straight away was appointed to direct um, this institute, which was, you know, which was a, a quite a, a, you know, a prestigious uh, institute uh, within the Ministry of Health and Welfare. Now, his uh, link with the feminism I'm talking about, I think, David, you're talking about the 1970s, so kind of second wave of feminism. Now, he died. <laughs> So in 1974, and he he basically retired from you know from the kind of you know the forefront you know the at the forefront um, in the in the late 1960s. So you know clearly, um, but actually, uh, having said that, uh, quite interesting kind of combination. So so feminism and birth control have kind of awkward relationship from the beginning anyway. And um, so in the end, so this is the story I want to um, also tell in the, in the next uh, project is um, how Koya was involved in, as a kind of like a figurehead um, uh, in the international kind of cooperation in, in family planning in the, in, the, in the 1960s when the government, but the Japanese government, you know, started to, you know, um, support um, overseas development aids and family planning programs within it. Um, there was an NGO called uh, Joseph, and he became the council, uh, he became the kind of head of um, advisory board. Now he then he had to uh, kind of work with uh, uh, um, Kato Shizue, who was also, uh, you know, who called herself a feminist and also a birth control um, activist since 1920s. So really interesting kind of dynamic dynamics going on uh, between Koya and and um, and Kato. But as a, as a kind of group, uh, feminist uh, feminist. No, I think he didn't. You know, he wasn't attacked or anything. He was hated by birth control activists though in the 1950s because you know before the war, Koya was saying. Birth control is bad because it promotes, you know, reverse selection. And then suddenly, after the war, he then became the, you know, this government spokesperson, you know, promoting birth control. So birth control activists who were, you know, locked up and um, and really kind of, you know, harassed by the government uh, in the post-war period, uh, pre-war period, they really didn't like where. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, amazing. I mean, that's exactly the kind of the question that I was thinking about. Yes. How how do you square uh, these different <laughs> uh, attitudes, right? Uh, so Janet Hunter asks in the chat, uh, your pictures show women being provided with contraceptive advice. Could you say something about how Koya and his international colleagues thought about the relative responsibilities of wives and husbands in relation to means of contraception? Was the science largely oriented towards female contraception? Yeah, this is a this is really interesting questions, of course. Um, so, you know, as 
uh, as some of you know, um, you know, the Japanese um, kind of contraceptive practices or, or family planning practices for a long time was considered, uh, you know, but, but basically was regarded as women's duty, right? So, um, so you know, the case of abortion, um, as Tiana Norgrim, you know, has mentioned, and, you know, contraceptive pills, you know, they were kind of women's matters. So, you know, uh, even though, you know, and, and, and sterilization as well, even though technically it was, you know, it'd be easier to sterilize, you know, um, the um, vasectomy was, you know, male vasectomy was technically easier than, you know, female sterilization. But many women uh, were, you know, mobilized for that. Um, so, yeah, so most of them, um, so even international, um, you know, Koya's international colleagues, um, one of the uh, big things, of course, apart from pill, contraceptive pill, um, one of the big things that um, the, um, this movement as, as, as a movement, um, you know, those taking part in the movement was, were really kind of putting forward was the intrauterine device, right? so IUD. Um, Again, you know, uh, Chikako Takeshita uh, actually um, uh, wrote a book about, wrote a book about this, uh, is how, you know, even though technically, I mean, you know, women really complained about, um, about the, you know, the un un you know, comfortable, you know, feelings it had and but but the population council, for instance, um, spent lots and lots of money for the development of IUDs. Um, IUDs were, in, and then in the end, uh, managed to you know um, produce it, you know, mass produced it, and and distributed it to you know. So so yeah, this was this was targeted right for for women. Uh, in India, though, I think the the story. So sometimes you know um, the um, the move, you know, sometimes the programs um, uh, use incentives, uh, so monetary incentives to promote, um, you know, contraceptives. And in the case of India, vasectomy, male for, among uh, males, was was taken up because you know they could get money, um, you know, if uh, and of course it was reversible, um, and so you know. But not not in Japan uh, and, and in uh, South Korea and in Taiwan, really aggressive campaign to promote uh, IUD. So you know you can actually see um, the kind of contraceptive practices even today uh, were really rooted around that time. You know in, in Asia certainly. Um, yeah. Thank you. The, we can now go to the Q and A. There's several questions here. And if we start with the top one, uh, why were the growing rates of abortion seen as a problem, as it still would have curbed the increase in population? Sorry, what was the, where, where, where is it? Um, well, if, if you click at the bottom of the, the Q and A. Q and A. It should come Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, answer. yeah, I understand. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, so, so, okay, so abortion was seen as a problem. Um, Firstly, because it also, you know, the technically, um, you know, it, at the time, the um, it wasn't, you know, the, the the it was quite harmful for for women's bodies. Well, at least Koya used that argument, right? It's really harmful for for women to, you know, to get abortion. So, you know, for health reasons, um, you know, it's, it's not a good idea. Contraceptives is much health. You know, I mean, in a way can, you know, less harmful for, for women's health. Um, but also it's interesting, interesting. There was an interesting study conducted by Koya and his, his again, his, his, his colleagues about the interval of, um, so, um, Kind of pregnancy, so uh, experience among women. So he compared; they compared the team compared women who have had abortion and when they get uh, pregnant next, uh, and compared those to those uh, compared that to the group to the group that didn't have abortion. And it turned out that um, well, they found out that the interval uh, between you know abortion and the next pregnancy is much shorter uh, among those, you know, those who have had abortion than 
those who didn't have abortion. So um, Koya then concluded that abortion is not a good family planning or kind of birth fertility regulation um, method. Right? So, so the, those are the those are the two reasons. Um, uh, yeah. And also, uh, there was another study that said abortion was also practiced among educated people. <laughs> so there's that eugenic argument as well. Yeah. Right. Um, there's another question uh, uh, asked by Rebecca Rimmer, um, who writes, Hello, Dr. Homer. You said that family planning is one of the case studies you are using in your book. I was wondering if you could tell us what the others will be. Oh, right. Um, so I look at uh, vital statistics, um, medical midwifery. Uh, I look at um, kind of social scientists or economists um, who were involved in the kind of policy, uh, policy debate on population problems in the 1920s. Uh, uh, and also uh, during wartime, I look at um, those uh, uh, va various kind of policy scientists who were um, kind of mobilized for national land planning. So these are the, yeah, and, and also I look at census, um, kind of census and population statistics. So these are the cases. Um, yeah. Do you want me to explain? No, I, I think I'm not. <laughs> Please read How many pages? <laughs> I mean, you. that's amazing because you, there's, there's so many, uh, and as you've shown, us uh, in this talk, you, you know, the, the, there's really an enormous amount of information um, I I and a lot to interpret. <laughs> <laughs> well, the machine wouldn't let you. There was something no. straight down. But how many pages uh, does the well, manuscript know. amount to? Well, I, I still need to get the, the proof, but um, it, it is it's 120. You know, I, I, I okay. did squeeze it into 120,000. So, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Okay, there's, there's another question in the Q&A by Lyman Gamberton. Um, thank you so much for your very fascinating talk. I was curious about the sterilization study you mentioned and was wondering if you could elaborate on it. Do we know whether the participants in that study were voluntary or coerced? I ask because state-sponsored sterilization programs in the USA were mostly, uh, were almost universally coercive. Yeah, um, so um, there was not a, uh, a so there was not a project that really specifically kind of, um, you know, sort of specialized in, you know, promoting sterilization. But Koya did um, kind of in passing mention sterilization um, as, a, as a choice. Um, so um, th that women could take. And, and apparently, yeah, some, some women did take it, you know, um, uh, the, the midwife I, I interviewed said, yeah, they, they, they took it um, because, you know, they had so many children, they didn't want to have, uh, you know, any more and, you know, they got, they got subsidies, so why not? But he wasn't, yeah, sorry, I think I, I might have um, kind of misrepresented uh, the case, but yeah, there was nothing that, you know, really kind of promoted sterilization itself always kind of contraception, contraception um, you know, by means of modern contraceptives, they call. Okay, there's, a, there's another question by uh, Christian Rook, um, who writes, is Koya still highly re regarded or has he fallen into disrepute? Racism, racism still exists in most societies and I do appreciate the high homogeneity, but I'm also thinking about the comments of a Japanese minister who claimed the Japanese were less susceptible to COVID-19 because of their race and implied superiority. Oh dear, yes. Um, so Koya is a, is, a, is a known figure, you know, among specialists, you know, among, uh, among historians who, you know, study reproduction, race science and, and such. But I don't know whether he's, you know, known so much. I mean, you know, of, of course he was the director of, you know, public, um, you know, Health Institute of Public Health. But again, this is a specialized institution. So there is not a, a kind of like a public wide wide public recognition of you know Koya um, as an individual, uh, you know not so much as Colton here or so um, no, um, but yeah what he said um, you know in in the forties and fifties is, is quite hard to read sometimes, um, yeah. 
And then following up from that, Alejandra Armendariz Hernandez asks, uh, were there also educational scientific films produced by COYA or other public institutions regarding sexual health and birth control? Yeah, thank you. Um, so this is a really good question as well, because um, so so-called propaganda or, or uh, kind of promotion uh, through visual uh, image was one of the uh, one of the things that um, um, that they, you know deployed in the in the transnational population control movement. Um, I would say though that uh, this came slightly later. So the so Koyas uh, was you know from the fifties and by the sixties you know um, the Japanese birth rate actually had fallen quite significantly. So you know there was a, there was a one or two you know continued studies from from you know. Uh, in the in the sixties, but really, birth control became a non-issue, you know, uh, in in the policy, you know, in policy, and, and along with that, uh, Koya's you know team's research interest kind of moved as well, and um, in the promotion through visual and films, and you know, that came slightly later is certainly in the promotion of birth you know contraceptives um so yeah there were lots of like um i, I think um some pictures in, including the one i couldn't see i, I couldn't show um uh, use you know kamishibai another this paper um how do you call it yeah like paper uh, theater or, or yeah paper, yeah like the street performance that's right that's right mm -hmm. uh, so that was used but um yeah but not not necessarily yeah films. Thank you. And there's a, another a comparative question. Um, what about backlash to the family planning movement in Japan? In other countries such as Zimbabwe, it came to be seen as racial oppression and took very many years of focus of contraception use for birth spacing and for after family completion, as well as increasing girls' education. So many women saw it as a freedom they wanted. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Um, so in the case of within within Japan itself, um, so there was not a, a huge backlash. Um, you know, of course, you know, at the time, um, the, the the discourse, the racial discourse that was forming at the time was that, you know, and, and certainly uh, the, um, you know, the research team was, you know, um, you know, using that discourse that, you know, Japan was a homo, you know, like hom this racial homogeneity. So, um, so it wasn't, you know, seen as a racial oppression. Um, and, you know, so, so it wasn't, no, there was not a huge uh, a backlash um, in that, in that regard. Um, in fact, um, you know, in, in the Japanese case, um, family planning was, you know, uh, um, massively promoted and, and kind of on the whole uh, was kind of positively welcomed. Um, it wasn't kind of, uh, kind of tied to um, oppression or anything like that, even if the discourse, you know, kind of underneath and, and also background has some oppressive components. Um, uh, I think it, it's, it is partly because um, it was also, um, you know, tied to, you know, like uh, Andrew Gordon described this uh, life improvement um, movement in the, in the post world, like, uh, which, which the company, you know, private and, and public corporation really aggressively um, Kind of promoted, right? So family planning was kind of integrated into that. Um, so yeah, it was it was kind of like a, a, a seen as kind of something modern um, and something kind of new family, new nuclear family would um, you know would take up. Thank you. And there's, there's, uh, there's another question in the chat by Yona Siderer, who asks, who were the children in the photo with Gamble? Koya? Uh, I, th I think um, it's, uh, I took this one out of a secondary source. So it was uh, uh, Gamble's biography, but it says uh, in, the, in, the, in the book, it says it was you know, take, taken in one of the test villages. I don't know which one, but um, yeah. 
Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> And, uh, and the last question in the Q&A, uh, so in the Japanese context, um, it was a more a class thing and an, and an issue of social elevation, especially among Japanese women than race, asks David Walter. Yeah, I, I would I would I would certainly say so, um, you know, uh, and um, uh, Koya also um, characterized, so for instance, one of the um, birth control pilot projects was in Katsushika Ward. And um, his, his, his idea is that, you know, they, they, and, and, you know, targeting specifically at um, recipient, you know, benefit rec receivers, right, recipients of um, social benefits. And, um, and the, the, the idea is, well, the idea is um, that, you know, uh, the, the, you know, they came in with the idea that, you know, the idea of reverse selection and da, 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 da. But, they quickly found out um, that those recipients, um, well, many of them were, you know, kind of in the, um, you know, kind of lower social, um, economic, socioeconomic classes, but some of them were kind of, kind of fallen through, you know, after the, you know, through the kind of uh, turmoil, war, you know, turmoil of the war, and so, you know, um, they uh, argue that, it, you know family planning, you know, birth control would at least help them to kind of come back, you know, in a way kind of go back to where they belonged. Um, so yeah, so certainly, a, 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 yeah, that disciplining of bodies uh, is certainly was a class thing um, in the post-war context, Japanese context. Right. I want to, I wanted to ask a last question uh, about the transnational aspect of things. So you talked about the sort of the, the transfer of knowledge and expertise, but also of people and of goods themselves. And I was wondering about, because so many of the contraceptive methods were based on, on rubber, based on, on, on latex, uh, you know, the pessaries, but also the, uh, the, the condoms, of course, whether there is a colonial history to, because the rubber trees obviously only grow in sort of dense rainforests, whether there is a colonial aspect uh, to that as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that is a really good question, which is, you know, which itself is a is a research question, isn't it? So maybe we have to be asking Mitch uh, Asso, <laughs> who's looked at the history of rubber in, in Vietnam, and maybe he can give us some good uh, idea. Yeah, that'd be really interesting. Um, something, yeah, it's just kind of like um, material culture is something I'm um, is, in, interested in, especially um, the... Um, yeah, the, the raw product, of course, certainly would have some colonial connection, but even ID, you know, even IUD, you know, the finished product itself, um, if you look at how they traveled, uh, you can you can see a history of, uh, in, in the case of IUD, certainly post-colonial, um, and, you know, post-colonial that was, you know, kind of, re cer certainly kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of founded on the history of Japanese colonialism, uh, and so yeah, that would be really interesting. But yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't tell. But yeah, that's another. Some if somebody could <laughs> do the research, that would be great. <laughs> I think I think that would be an excellent project. Yeah, I think so too. Of medicine and materiality. Yeah, excellent. So um, join me, please, in thanking uh, Dr. Aya Home for a really fascinating talk. Uh, Thank you all for coming. Uh, I just wanted to remind you that in two weeks time on the very 1st of December, we'll have our next session and we'll move from the beginning of life and how to stop it uh, to the end of life and how to, well, probably uh, prolong uh, life itself. Um, it will be a talk and a film screening called Can Robotics Aided Care Be Person-Centered? Uh, and uh, both uh, Professor Naonori Kodate and Professor David Prendergast um, will be here uh, to present present the film, and then um, I will be hosting a Q and A afterwards. Uh, so please join us again. Um, but for now, thank you very much. Uh, it was a really um, very fascinating talk. Um, uh, have a nice evening and take care. Thank you.